Hi, just a quick follow up on this Vata 15 minute nickel metal hydride battery charger I looked at in the previous video, did a tear down and uh, kind of reverse engineered the uh, the main switching topology and charging circuit for the batteries and things like that. And a lot of people wanted me to uh, follow up and actually uh, probe this thing and see what's happening here because one of the outstanding issues from uh, last time I didn't have time to look at is how they were actually measuring the uh, discharge current for this uh, thing. We knew that uh, the DC to DC converter was um, basically putting all the batteries in series and there was a shunt measurement shunt resistor down the bottom down here. And we also knew that by nature of this uh, dual MOSFET uh, configuration for each battery cell here. So here's each battery and there's a pair of uh, MOSFETs across each one. And let me show you uh, the switching arrangement, how they can switch cells in and out, um, depending on uh, which of these MOSFETs they turn on. So if you turn on the top one, one here for example then uh, you're going to charge the battery okay so it's going to go through there and around down to there but if you uh, turn the bottom one on you can completely bypass that boom and go straight down to the next one so uh, effectively they can switch in and out any one of these cells depending on the arrangement of these uh, MOSFETs here. And it's rather clever, actually. I like it. Um, it's a nice implementation. Now, for this example, uh, if you have this MOSFET here, the lower MOSFET turned on, and you're bypassing this cell, what happens if you actually plug in the cell? Well, nothing, because the body diode inside here okay, will actually be reverse biased. So uh, the battery, this is the negative terminal of the battery, positive terminal's up here. So the uh, cathode of the body diode here is going to be uh, positive with respect to the uh, anode here. So therefore, that di the body diode is reverse biased. And because you haven't turned the gate on, that gate voltage is zero because it's an N-channel uh, MOSFET, then no current is going to flow out of the battery at all. And all you've got over here is just a sense line. So bingo, you just alternate between those two FETs and you can turn each individual cell off and on. Same here. If you turn this one on, you can bypass it. Now, let's say you only plugged in this battery here, for example, then... Okay, then it would detect that there's a voltage on here. So the micro uh, controller through the analog to digital converter is always checking these sense lines here and it detects, oh, you just plugged in that battery. Okay, I will switch on this MOSFET and bingo, will charge that battery. And then nothing plugged into the bottom one will, so we'll turn on this FET and bingo, current flows down through the current shunt resistor and we can measure it. Now, of course, one thing we don't know is how they're actually doing the discharge. Let's say you had battery plugged into this uh, third position over here and it detected it. OK, and but you put it in uh, discharge mode because it's got various it's got charge mode, discharge mode. It's also got uh, test mode as well, which will uh, discharge the battery and then charge it so it can measure the battery capacity, get the accumulated charge. But, you know, if you turn both of these MOSFETs on, then well, you're just going to short out your battery like that. And well, you know, that's no good. You need to have, how are they actually measuring it? Because we, in the teardown of this thing, I couldn't really find any current sense resistor. So they must actually be switching it on and possibly using uh, this current shunt resistor down here like this. So um, they might be actually uh, discharging them all in series, just like they're charging them all in series, and then calculating the discharge current based on the uh, differential sense voltage across the cell here. Because you'll notice here, if we go into discharge mode, bingo, we've actually got a slightly different uh, discharge current for each one. So it kind of doesn't make sense. Uh, if they were all being discharged in series like this, then, you know, you think they'd just measure the one uh, current and then it'd be the same for all of them. But I don't know, maybe they're just calculating this and they're actually multiplexing this. They're actually switching individual cells like off and on and actually measuring things like that. So what we want to do is actually get out the scope and actually have a look if this thing is uh, truly a constant current charge, uh, we'll look at the charge first. Is it actually a constant current charge or do they uh, actually do multiplexing and switch uh, these MOSFETs off and on? So let's take a look with the scope. 
Now, before we just go in here willy-nilly and actually hook up uh, all of our channels, because we've actually got eight MOSFETs on here, and ideally I'd like to actually get eight probes on there, but we've only got a four-channel uh, scope here, but we do have our logic analyzer. So what I want to check first is just to see if the MOSFET drive uh, signals on here are actually uh, digital and what uh, signal level they're at. So what we'll do is we'll probe one of the MOSFETs here. I'm doing a bottom uh, MOSFET at the moment, so let's have a look at the bottom, and bingo, we're uh, 5 volts uh, per division, 5, 10, 15, we're driving these MOSFETs, MOSFETs with 15 volts, and that's actually not surprising, given that uh, you really have to turn these MOSFETs on hard, really drive them hard to get the lowest on resistance uh, possible, uh, so you get minimise the loss in them, the power dissipation in them, because they're only little SO8 uh, packages tiny. I think someone may have actually asked that uh, question. Uh, you know, how do they get away with, you know, 8 amps charging on this thing with little uh, SO8 packages? It's because the on resistance is, is incredibly low. So they're driving it with 15 volts. Let's check the upper MOSFET now. Probe the upper MOSFET. It's, nope, it's sitting down at ground. It's sitting down there at ground. Nothing doing there at all. And uh, it should be identical for all the next channels. This is the, well, channel 3 here, 15 volts once again, and they're all the same. And that makes sense when you've got uh, no batteries uh, plugged into this thing. You want this bottom MOSFET turned on so that you're basically bypassing each cell, as we uh, mentioned before. You don't want to be uh, turning the top one. You only want to switch on the charge to a battery when you detect that there's a voltage across there. I'm going to use my uh, logic analyzer probes here. These are the new uh, Keysight ones, uh, real tiny compared to the uh, the huge ones that they actually had before. This is my new uh, 3000 X series uh, touch oscilloscope, which Agilent uh, replaced my existing one with. Very nice, very compact. I rather like those. <laughs> Pretty sexy. Now, when you're probing something like this, make sure you turn the power off first. And even using these very tiny easy hooks here, um, there is still the potential to short out between the uh, pins. So, yeah, you don't want to short your gate pin out to your uh, source terminal there. That could be bad news. And you don't want them flapping around in the breeze either when you're, uh, like, because I'm going to have to probe some uh, analog, uh, some other stuff on here too. I know I might need to get in there. But anyway, for now, for the purposes of this experiment, got to put some batteries in here. Just want to have a look at all eight uh, gate signals. So I've just uh, taped those down so they're not going to flap around in the breeze and accidentally, you know, like if I put uh, any, uh, accidentally touch these, they're not just going to fall down and accidentally short out. And there's no worries with the uh, input voltage range of these dig digital channels either. They're uh, plus minus uh, 40 volts uh, capable. Um, just set it to uh, CMOS trigger in here, which is 2.5 volts. Yeah, whatever. Good enough. I, I should actually change that user threshold. I've got a touch screen here. I can change that user threshold up to, you know, I don't know, 8 volts. There we go. Again, it goes up to 8 volts maximum. That'll do. Actually, there was a trap for young players here. Uh, if you read the specs for this, uh, for the digital channels here, sure it can accept up plus minus 40 volts, but the dyna the input dynamic range of these digital channels is only uh, 10 volts around the threshold voltage. So whatever threshold voltage is set. So if we had 2.5 volts before, in theory, well, according to the spec sheet, uh, then the maximum input dynamic range would only be 12.5 volts, but it'd probably still work, but yeah, um, yeah, that's not terrific. So there's a, a trade-off there between the usable dynamic range and the, uh, maximum input threshold voltage versus, uh, maximum input voltage versus your threshold voltage. How nasty. Oh, don't, don't want that. Bloody touchy-feely scopes. And I'm sorry that it's next to impossible to get all of this in one shot. Uh, inserting this, the screen at uh, a reasonable resolution, and the uh, schematic as well. Anyway, I've got the eight digital uh, channels uh, up here, and they're actually as per the schematic here. So uh, channel like D0 at the bottom here is this lower MOSFET, then channel 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So we've got it switched on, and as you can see, the, uh, the lowest, um, the lower MOSFET for each one is actually switched on. So what I'll do is I'll, uh, well, high, switching on being high that is and let's plug in a battery and we'll see 
I'll plug it into the bottom one here, okay? So we should see the, these two MOSFETs switch. D, D0 should drop uh, low and D1 should go high. So we're switching on the upper MOSFET to charge where, and we're turning off the lower MOSFET, which is a disable. So here we go. Bingo, there we go. It just switched, you saw it? Hey, hello. Hello. We have ourselves a pulse that's walking away from us. This thing looks like it might be, well, it's switching off. Hmm. Now I've got this at a low time base. That's 200 milliseconds uh, per division. So I'm not uh, triggering off anything at the moment. It's just free running. Let me plug in another battery. Okay, I've plugged in a second one, and there's something happening. Hey, look at that. That's interesting. Let's try and capture that. At the moment, I'm just free running. I need to trigger off uh, these digital channels. So we'll trigger off the uh, D0 down here. So we can just go into trigger, source, and then we can uh, choose D0 down here. So let's, uh, let's trigger off D0. There we go. And we can zoom that out. There we go. That's interesting. Wow. And I suspect if we put in the third and the fourth batteries, we'll see some extra stuff happening up here. So I'm not sure of the time period. It's probably like a second or something. But I think it might be uh, switching those off every second. I'm going to plug in all four batteries. Let's switch this puppy on and uh, see what happens. Here we go. There we go. We got something convoluted happening here across, uh, well, except for the uh, fourth channel. So I don't know what happened, what's happening in channel four. Maybe it's not charging. Hmm. There we go, it just had a dicky contact. But as you can see, they're switching something in there. So let's turn that down to, uh, well, 200 milliseconds per division. Let's see if we get anything. No, let's turn it down to 500. It's got to be a period there. There we go. One second. There you go. Interesting. And what I'm just doing here is actually uh, labeling the channels. I've made them bigger to fit the full screen because we're just looking at the digital here. And uh, I like the new uh, QWERTY uh, keyboard on this thing because we can just go in here and then bingo with the touch screen. We can just, you know, type in anything we want. What I like is that um, we've got an auto increment uh, function here. So I can select, I've already labeled uh, this bottom one, bypass one, bypass two, it automatically imp incremented to bypass three. We can apply the new label and then we can go, uh, okay, we want, we've already got those three, that one D6, apply new label, bam, too easy. Okay, so that makes it easier. Bypass channel one and charge channel one and so on for the other channels. And as you can see, we're 500 milliseconds up per division. So each second is a new cycle. I just realized I labeled these different to what I've got on the uh, schematic here. Oops, anyway. Um, let's just say like number one down here, okay? For the first 500 milliseconds, it's actually bypassed. That battery is not being charged. Charged. And then uh, for the next 500 milliseconds, you can see that uh, it does charge because then the charge goes high, charge line goes high for 500 milliseconds. And then, of course, the bypass. These are always alternate uh, ones. I don't think um, there's a scenario where you're going to have both uh, charge and your bypass on at the same time because, well, you'd be shorting your battery out. So as you can see, they have... Uh, at, for the first 500 milliseconds, uh, number one battery is on, number two is off, number three is on, number four is off. So they're doing two at once here and then alternating between them. But we've also got this little data that's going on in there. I'm not sure what that business is. That might have to do with the measurement. But whatever it's doing in there for 20, 40, 50 uh, milliseconds, that's not a coincidence, I think. That's precisely 50 milliseconds. Something's going on in there. Anyway, you can see how they're always uh, alternate for each uh, channel. You'll never get both of those MOSFETs on at the same time. One's high here, one's low here. 
And here's a limitation with the uh, memory on this scope, even though we've got four meg uh, sample memory, okay, but because we got such a slow uh, time base, we're looking at, you know, this sample rate for our digital channels, 50k samples per second, right? Because we're capturing like, you know, two seconds, we've got like, uh, what is it, uh, you know, five seconds worth of data there on this thing that we're actually capturing. When we actually go in, there's a limit to how far we can see. It shows a block because that's one entire sample like that. So there's a limit to uh, what we can see there. To get around that, you would need a, either a deeper memory a scope slash logic analyzer, or you need a logic analyzer with uh, sample compression, or you could do it using um, uh, segmented uh, uh, segmented memory as well. Okay, so we figured out what it's doing charging. It certainly is multiplexing these batteries. Let's now uh, turn it back on. I'll put it into uh, discharge mode and see what happens. I'll uh, do this off camera because it could get fiddly. Hang on, I've got to move the camera. All right, so I'll switch it on. We're in charge mode. Excuse me, I've got to... Uh... Discharge, there we go. We're discharging all four batteries around about 400 milliamps. What's going on here? Let's run it. Come on, you can do it. Hey, look at that. So that's really interesting. There is not, yeah, we're definitely updating. There's nothing updating there. I'm at 500 milliseconds per division, unless it's doing it out at uh, 10 seconds. Maybe I can, you know, leave it like that. But I know we would have, we would have seen something. Um, it looks like they're all, uh, the bypass uh, FET for each one is on. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at the circuit arrangement, but it's not doing any multiplexing dur during uh, discharge. Well, that's damn confusing. We've got the discharge MOSFET uh, on for each one of the channels, and that's the path that would be taken. But as I said, because the positive terminal of the battery is up here, the body diode of the uh, MOSFET is switched off here, 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 and here. So, like, where is the discharge path? Where is the discharge path from this battery? Where's it going? It can only go two directions, that way or that way. And if it goes this way, and, yeah, it's there could be something over on this sense line here that's, you know, pulling it down and, you know, allowing current to flow through. And uh, But, like, meh, where's the other? And then are they sensing this resistor? I couldn't uh, see any sense lines connected, any, like, differential lines across that resistor. And then, even if you did do that, if it was flowing this way somehow, well, how would you discharge your AAA? Because your AAA is connected here. So, like, I... I uh... And also, we're talking like half a watt as well, because it's like 400 milliamps discharge, right? So that's in the order of half a watt. That's got to be dissipated somewhere. And by the way, I have checked the output of the uh, DC to DC converter. It's basically, uh, it's zero. Um, so, but I don't see a discharge path here. How is current getting out of these batteries? The top MOSFET is switched off. And yes, uh, it's not just the digital channel. I did actually get back in there with the scope and did actually check. And the gate voltage of these upper MOSFETs is actually zero. So it's not partially turned on or anything like that. Anyway, let's go back to charging, shall we? I don't know what the discharge thing is happening there. So let's just, I can just reset the damn thing. And uh, we will go back to... Oh, 500 microseconds, that's no good. We'll go back to our uh, 500 milliseconds, and what I want to do is just uh, take out a battery or two. And uh, so there we go. So there's only two batteries being charged at any one time because we've got our uh, four amps discharge instead of eight. So let's take out this top one. What change have we got? There we go. We've definitely, it's bypassed, it's switched into bypass mode there. Although, hey, oh, yep, yeah, there we go. It just took time to update. So let's now take off. Oh, it doesn't matter because there, it doesn't matter which order. So we can take out the top one here just because I've got access to it. And let's see if we've got, what happens when we've got two batteries. 
bingo on for the full period so there you go that's the eight amps that's the difference between the uh, eight amps and the four amp charge now they're basically uh both on for the entire period and by the way i have actually tried to get in there with uh my 10 amp uh m with my meter in 10 amp mode and actually measure the charge current but it looks like the drop is too much the voltage drop in there and you know due to the leads and the burden voltage of the meter and everything else and uh it just it, it just does not charge so yeah it's uh, tricky business sort of you know if you want to measure the current here you've got to do it uh right you've got to set up everything correctly and well you know you can't just bodge in a meter and expect a measurement uh because you know the safety cutouts in here you know even a few millivolts uh difference can uh, be the difference between uh, shutting the thing off or not. So I'll show you that on camera. Maybe, maybe it might work this time because I've discharged this one a little bit. I don't know. Let's have a look. So I've put in a bit of... Oh, there we go. No. Oh, hello. No, see, it just shut off. But there you go. Yeah, we did see like seven and a half amps on there very briefly. So we can try that again before the... Uh, you know, we've only got a second before it gets to its next uh, detection window. And uh, there we go, seven, seven and a half. Yep, and just switches off. But there you go, it does actually charge at, uh, well, seven and a half, eight. Yeah, you know, near enough. And if I discharge just one battery, then, well, it's exactly the same as before. All, uh, all of the bypass FETs are turned on and all the uh, uh, charge FETs are turned off. Now, I think it's appropriate at this point that we break out a tool that's incredibly valuable if you got it. It's this AIM uh, TTI iProber 520. It's a positional current probe, and you might have seen this. I've used it just a couple of times in videos, but it's incredibly handy. What it is is it's basically an isolated probe with a, uh, a magnetic field uh, measurement uh, coil on the end and can basically give you um, allows you to get in there and probe individual uh, traces and look at the current flowing through them. Perfect for an application like this where you've got like, you know, substantially high currents, not easy to break into things. And we can just put this on the trace here, for example, and hook it up to our scope. It's got an oscilloscope output here and uh, we can actually look at the charging and discharging waveforms through various PCB traces. So let's give it a go. Now, because of the uh, relative nature of the uh, measurement on this thing, if you want an absolute quantitative measurement, i.e. it to be calibrated and accurate uh, in terms of uh, volts per amps output, then uh, it, you've got to actually calibrate the thing with this built-in uh, calibrator. There's a little PCB uh, trace down here. I've done this in a previous video, but I might just run over it again. Now, you've got this uh, calibration chart inside here, and basically you need to know the trace width you're measuring. I think my ones it's complicated because there's actually that uh the one with the link installed so it's a link with a pcb trace underneath and uh, it's like you know it, it's all completely dodgy anyway we'll have a go um i think it's about three millimeters uh, wide so we're looking at around about uh, the calibrator output of three volts peak to peak so let's set that up so what we want to do here stick this in the calibrator whack it on ac here and you'll notice how it's a little bit fiddly you want to get in the position so it's the uh, so it's the highest amplitude you basically can't go over pretty much and you'll notice that if i rotate it it drops in amplitude because well it's uh perpendicular to the uh trace so and of course if we go in the other direction i can show you this as well if you have dc for, uh, switch it to dc instead of ac you'll notice that one way is positive and the other way is negative so you can actually detect current in both directions with this thing anyway we need to set this thing to uh, three volts peak to peak so i adjust the sensitivity here until we're just around about way we're over there let's turn it down whoa there silver sovereign all right three volts peak to peak there we go we're ready to go hopefully that'll give us you know a roughly an absolute value but like i said we don't need an absolute value here uh, measuring this thing uh, just to get just to see the waveforms is enough you don't actually need a quantitative uh, measurement but hey you know i just thought i'd do that for kicks 
And then when you're mucking around with current probes like this, you can actually go into uh, your channel, go into your probe setup here, and instead of the regular volts, uh, volts per division, we can change this to amps uh, per division, and then the probe itself, it's already, actually just happens to already be set up at one volts per amp, which is exactly what we set this thing up for. So now our peak to peak value here will actually be in milliamps, um, instead of uh, volts. It's, it's just nicer. Most uh, modern scopes, so you'll be able to set up uh, current probes like this. It's very handy. Now let's actually put our probe on here and see if we're accurate. I, I think it's going to be pure luck if we're actually accurate or not. That's actually, I got it round backwards. You see how it went negative there? So we just spin it around. Not that it matters, uh, positive or negative. But there we go. It looks like we've got some ripple in there. We might be able to trigger on that, but you'll notice that we're uh, 2 amps uh, per division. Hopefully you can see that. 2 amps uh, per division, so 2, 4, 6. Yeah, we're kind of, you know, there's 7. We're kind of, sort of, not, not there. Hang on. What's gone wrong? Something's happened. Oh, <laughs> the battery's actually full and it just cut off. <laughs> Go figure. But we got within a reasonable ballpark there, just over 6 amps or something like that. And you'll notice that, hey, there we go, that is our current switching off and on. There it is, you can see it. Bingo, we're capturing exactly what we did before. If we go to 500 milliseconds per division, then we'll actually see that current, uh, yep, bang, 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 there we go. Now let's see if we can have a look at that ripple. I've gone into uh, AC... Mode, oh damn it, have we, uh, we're full again, another bloody full battery. And there we go, that's our AC ripple, look at that, we're at uh, 10 microseconds per division, eh, about two divisions there, around about 50 kilohertz uh, switch in frequency or thereabouts. So that is our, D that's our DC to DC converter, so, and there we go, 500 milliseconds, you'll see it switch. Bang, bang, bang. So what I'm effectively measuring down there, that link on the bottom, that's actually just in here. It's uh, like, it's before this uh, shunt. I can't quite get into the, in there with the uh, shunt unless I uh, get rid of all of these anyway. It's, but still, it's that uh, ground trace that comes out of there. So effectively measuring the current through that shunt. And yes, of course, the good thing about having a mixed signal uh, oscilloscope like this digital analog in the same scope is we can actually correlate the uh, analog uh, channel up here with the all the digital stuff that we saw down here so we capture it and bingo here's the analog you can see that it uh, switches the charge switches off bam like that when our uh, charge level here actually goes low and switches back on and then we've got a uh, large amount of ring in there when the uh, dc to dc converter uh, starts back up that constant uh, current source because you can see the currents actually drop into zero if you remember the schematic it's not just bypassing the battery which it can do it's actually switching off the converter, because if it was just bypassing the battery, we would still see the uh, constant uh, current flowing through that PCB trace. Um, and But it wouldn't be flowing through the batteries, but we're not. So it is physically switching off the DC to DC converter, that constant current source, and then switching it back on. Boop, it takes a little while to recover there. What does it take? Oh, a few, only a couple of milliseconds. Yeah, no worries. And uh, then the charge switches back on. So bingo, it's nice to be able to correlate things like that. This is where if you've got like a, a USB uh, logic analyzer, for example, then you've got your analog scope trying to correlate the two. It's just much nicer when you have the one instrument like this. Okay, so what I want to do now is actually turn it into discharge mode. Okay, so let's get, there we go. We've got our charge mode up there. Okay, so we've got our six amps where uh, two amps per division. And let's switch it and see what's flowing through that trace. I think I've got the right button here. Bam. Hello? 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 500 millivolts per division. Bingo. Look at this. It's gone negative. It's gone negative. You saw it. From uh, charge mode going into discharge mode, the current through that trace is negative. That is, like, I, I haven't changed the position of the probe, so it's gone from positive to negative. It's flowing the other direction. Wow, that's interesting. 
So like I said, I'm measuring this point here. So when it's charging, current is flowing down through here like this. But when we uh, set to discharge mode, current's flowing up. It's definitely throwing, flowing through that trace. You saw it. What was it? 600 odd milliamps there. We've got an error. We know it's measuring about 400 milliamps on this thing. But there was definitely current flowing back through. So how the hell is it, is it doing that? Wow, is, there, is this going negative or something? What? And by the way, if you're curious to know how accurate the voltage is on this thing, I'm going to, uh, it's 1.371 on there, and on the display here, sorry I can't show you, 1.32, so eh, near enough. I think there might be some more error up at 8 amps. So let's measure the charge. I'm now charging at 8 amps. Wow, look at that, 1.84 volts. Wow, that's above the recommended cutout, which is usually 1.8. And it's displaying 1.59, there we go, 1.6. So there's a 200 millivolt discrepancy there. So the uh, differential uh, measurement, or maybe they're not even doing differential measurement, is quite poor. So that, that, yeah. That's not good at all. I'm, that's a bit how you're doing. Not happy with that. Um, by the way, I've shown this in previous videos, but I'll just uh, say it again. Another trap for young players. Watch this. If I turn this probe, you might be able to see the green, green trace move there. That's a 2 amps per division. That is the Earth's magnetic field doing that, and it's actually worse. I didn't, <laughs> and didn't compensate for that before. If I'm now at 500 milliamps per division, ooh, look at that. Way, that's not terrific, is it? <laughs> right in the middle of nowhere. So you've actually got a trace position control on the unit itself. So you've got to center that down there when you've got it in position. And it's actually not too far off the displayed value now that I've actually zeroed that thing. It's uh, 500 milliamps uh, per division there. And we're getting, you know, around about, uh, you know, that 350 or 400, what it's actually displaying on the thing. So it's not too far off. So absolute calibration. Yeah, you know, it's going to be within, you know, we can uh, like 20% or something. Now, what I'm going to check now is a trace up the top. I don't know, like the width. I haven't set the width properly. I'd have to recalibrate to get absolute. I just want to see if there's anything there. If there's anything flowing into this. So if it's like going somehow back up the chain and out here. So there's a trace right on top here. If I zero that. And nope, nothing. It's not budging. So there's nothing flowing through that trace going back to the DC to DC converter. So I'm still none the wiser where this damn current is coming from or going. I think I'm going to have to uh, disconnect all these uh, clips again because we've done that. We've, uh, you know, figured out that the thing's multiplex and everything. Have another decent look at the, um, at the traces in there. See if I can see anything. Hmm. And oh! Stupid me, if I spent a few more minutes actually uh, reverse engineering this board before I went off half cocked and uh, did the schematic, yes, I would have found the discharge path. Here it is, it's bleedingly obvious. There's actually, um, here, okay, here's the positive terminal of the lower battery here. Here's the shunt I was measuring uh, before, by the way, that ground shunt. Um, and here's the uh, top MOSFET. So the positive terminal, okay, it actually, there's a trace that goes off under there and it snakes off around there, around there, around there, into bingo Q25 here. That's got to be a little, that's a little SOT23 uh, MOSFET. And then there's two um, 6R2 resistors in parallel under that, that actually then go back to ground on the other side. Here's that current uh, shunt resistor in there. And so the other side of that, bingo. And it wasn't so obvious on uh, these ones here, for example. Here's the next one and then the next one. So there's actually four of these uh, duplicate uh, discharge um, transistors, discharge MOSFETs. And this actually drops down through some vias into a trace and actually ends up under the uh, chip here, actually under the thing. So there's vias under there and it goes on the other side. So you just got to follow these things carefully.
And of course, what does that translate into? Well, here it is, positive terminal of the battery, and we've got ourselves a, uh, once again, it'll be like an N-channel uh, MOSFET there, and uh, two uh, 6R2s in parallel, so 3.1 ohms, uh, 1.3 volts divided by, you know, uh, roughly uh, one, uh, 3.1 ohms, gives us around about that 400 odd milliamps we'll see in. Bingo, and then they can just measure the uh, drop across this. But of course, some of you might be saying, Dave, I actually saw the current change direction through this current shunt. What the hell's going on? Well, it's easy if you think about it. During charge, okay, it comes down through the, uh, through the ladder of MOSFETs like here, through here, and then down the battery. So the current is flowing in this direction when it's charging, okay, which is what we got. And when we discharged, it was flowing in the other direction. How does it do that? Well, of course, the positive terminal of the battery, it's now flowing out here like this. So, um, of course, we're doing conventional current flow, none of this electron current flow rubbish, okay? So going from the positive through the MOSFET, down through here, and it's going into ground, but there's, or as always, right, Kirchhoff's current law, like there must be a loop there, right? So that current, where does it go? It goes through the ground plane, and then, bingo, back up through there like that. So that's why the current changes direction. Now I know that I said this was going to be a quick video and well as always that was the intention but you know I got carried away, got a little bit excited, you know I went down the rabbit hole and uh, and anyway we eventually found out what the hell was happening here. Yes these are all, uh, these are multiplexed um, and we've got, we found the uh, discharge path in the thing, and we realised that uh, the voltage sensing on there wasn't that great. You know, it's it's not terrific. So it's it's really is it's kind of like a clever design. Like I really like the way that they've done the uh, switching in this thing. It really is quite uh, clever, but you know, it's, in the end, um, it's not a great you know, accurate implementation uh, in terms of uh, charging and voltage detection and that sort of thing. So yeah, it's a bit rough and ready, but hey, you know, it's built down to a cost and that's what you get. But anyway, I hope you liked that little uh, adventure here. We got to play around with our little uh, current uh, probe. This is always fun to play around with. You ever get a chance to get one of these puppies? They're not cheap. I think, don't quote me, but they're like 700 bucks or something. But these are really great. You know, you don't have to break in to uh, the power supply. And it's insulated, so you can get in into, you know, really high voltage uh, stuff. Get in there, like, you know, high voltage switch mode power supplies and actually probe stuff and get the waveforms. It's absolutely fantastic. Incredibly valuable tool for stuff like that. It would have been really ugly if we had to get in there and, you know, hack in uh, current shunts and meters and things like that, you know, cut the traces and, oh, it's just, yeah, really quite ugly. So this is a really handy uh, tool. And that's a really good example of using it. We uh, did some good examples of uh, mixed signal capture there and things like that. A bit of uh, reverse engineering and circuit tracing. It had a bit of all this video. So hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up. And if you want to comment, EV blog forum, link down below, all that sort of jazz. Catch you next time.